welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Welcome back, everyone, to the Ask the Educator podcast. My name is Adam Okada. And we just got done with our PB70 webinar, our international webinar for the month of January. And I'd like to welcome in the hosts or the uh, co-chairs of PB70, uh, Sharon Rojo and Jill Holdsworth. Sharon, welcome in. Thank you, Adam. And Jill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we want to get started. This was a really great, informative podcast. Let's talk about PB70. It's not the one, it's not sexy, it's not ST91, <laughs> it's not ST79, it's not the ones everybody knows and talks about. But your co-chairs are. <laughs> yeah, the co-chairs are definitely sexy for sure. You guys have great headshots. It's going to look great on YouTube for us. But what is PB70? What is this uh, thing and how, do, how does it relate to the ANSI Amy universe as it relates to documents? Well, as you know, SC79 and 91 really get that publicity, right? So Jill and I were really focusing on giving the PR that the PB70 document deserves. And the PB70 document is really about protective barriers and what the manufacturer side, you know, needs to basically do when it re in regards to labeling, when it, uh, testing, the sampling method, and as well as the different levels inside the document that specifies what's in it and what the levels mean and what the criteria is for testing for each one of those levels. And for the user end is really going to be about the type of level that they were going to be choosing or making that good decision on the type of tasks that they're performing, whether it's decontam, isolation, or, or even a surgical drape and then surgery. And so that kind of what the document is about, but it goes over again in detail into that testing and sampling and um, classification. Perfect. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Like, what is the document and and how it relates to those other ones? It is kind of an Amy document. It's just in a different um, specialty, right, than sterilization right. or flexible scopes. Uh, so, Jill, this next one's for you. What's important about PB70 that sterile processing, OR, IP professionals, uh, why should we pay attention to PB70? Yeah, it, and so I'm going to take this kind of each profession at a time. As an IP myself, I would tell other IPs to really try to understand the document. And, and you know, I think as IPs, if, if you didn't know PB70 existed, you probably had no idea where all these Amy classifications came from. We talk all the time about, you know, this is Amy level three, Amy level four, but do you really understand where those classifications came from? And so kind of reading the document, understanding uh, what types of gowns should be used where is important so that you can help your team members stay safe. And then looking at those changes that we talked about during the webinar. And one of the things that we really talked about was that new decontamination gown, which is also what the sterile processing professionals and leaders will really want to pay attention to because it is new. So it won't be out immediately. We just published the document yesterday. Um, so we're not going to see this immediately. But what we did talk about was what is that minimum criteria of a decontamination gown? So you can take the document and make sure that your teams are safe now with what the new guidelines are. So take what that decontamination gown is is rated for and make sure that your decon staff or your reprocessing staff in, in your high-level disinfection areas are all meeting those standards, even though that decon designated gown isn't out yet. So there's still some things that we can do until manufacturers catch up with these new guidelines. And then really looking at that surgical gown E, which stands for extended critical zone, and thinking about how would I use this? And have have I always wished that there was a gown that provided a little bit of an extra coverage? And really, that's what we were thinking of with this 
surgical gown E classification is when you have a, a surgical procedure or a task that had a little bit of an extra spray, splash, body fluid that was causing strike through or was coming through getting onto your scrubs because there there's just a lot more. And some of the procedures that we all know that have that, it would be great to have a little bit of extra coverage on the front for that. So really starting to think about how would we use this and do we have a use for this in certain venues? And, and so that's really where IPs, OR professionals can really start to work together to think about that. So when manufacturers start to advertise this, they can say, okay, we're ready. We know exactly how we're going to use this together. And, and that's where risk assessments come in. Risk assessments don't have to be scary. They're as easy as that. Yeah. Risk assessments don't need to be scary, right? I mean, you're really just looking at the risks involved in any activity. And then you get a multidisciplinary team, IP, risk, sterile processing, OR, whoever's involved, and and really just kind of talk about these things. And what you've done is created a lot of guidance with PB70 that they can look at and say, okay, well, here's the risks. And then here's the level we need to look at yeah. based on those risks. Uh, one of the things that Jill mentioned, Sharon, I'm going to send this next question over to you. Uh, she mentioned the critical zones on the gowns. Mm-hmm. Can you go into a little detail? I can't discuss the... Poll questions of our selections of from my daughter's bedroom or Jill's <laughs> kid's bedroom or something. No, <laughs> I, I was going to say, I think I might consider it my kid's bedrooms, but that wasn't the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is the critical zone is basically the area of, of the pr- of protective apparel where there's direct contact with blood or body fluids or the OPIM, which would be other possible infectious material. Thank you, Jill. I got that in my head now. <laughs> that will mostly occur in that area. So that's kind of that straightforward definition. Yeah, in the critical zones, I mean, I'm thinking as a, a decontam tech myself, right? Right in the front, right where you're kind of your belly is against the uh, the sink line, where you're going to get a lot of splashback. Yes. That would be a critical zone, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so on, on those gowns, you really want to have kind of that extra layer of protection um in those zones thicker or some other kind of material uh so i really appreciate that you guys thought about that and created these critical zones on the gowns uh jill can you describe some of the changes or the updates to pb70 because this document came out uh now we're recording on the 19th of january so it was the 18th of january that it came out we timed it perfectly uh (laughs) to coincide with the release of pb70 but what changes can we expect to see uh, in to the document, and then what also? What changes are we going to see in the marketplace as far as what we're going to look at in the future? Yeah, so I, I did mention a couple of them already, so I spoiled a, a, a couple of them. But what the committee really wanted to do was to expand what the document contained. So the last time that that we came out with a PB seventy document was in two thousand and twelve. So we've been working on expanding um, how much we could cover in this document. So it really was limited to surgical gowns, surgical drapes and isolation gowns as categories in the past. So we have really expanded the the categories and the definitions of of this type of apparel that is now included in this document so that it it really is tailored to the task, to the department, and to the user, which is is really for the benefit of everybody, for um, safety, uh, for comfort, and, and and for the manufacturer too, so that we can really tailor to what we're doing and which ultimately will lead to worker safety. And um, so we're, you're going to see terms like full coverage gown, protective gown with non-protective back, protective gowns with open backs. Um, you're going to see some new things um, like labeling requirements, meaning expiration dates, labeling requirements regarding those terms I just used about the protective, the non-protective back, the open backs, and requirements so that the user is very clear on what they're putting on so that they're not confused if they put on a gown with a back, does it have protection or not? So that we're very clear on what type of protection we're getting from our PPE. So those new labeling requirements basically went into effect yesterday. So of course, there's a grace period for manufacturers to start putting that um, on their labels, but now it will be very clear what you're using. And again, this is where risk assessments become very important. So is an open back appropriate for the task that you're doing and in the environment that you're in? Or is a full coverage gown what you really need because you need the back coverage? And you'll also see protective hoods with togas or toga ensembles 
in this document, which we added because this is something that is used and we felt it was important to make sure that we put some parameters around where the critical zones and protective areas were for TOGA ensembles. So we wanted to be really all encompassing for all tasks, all users and all environments for this um, protective apparel, because that is that is what is important. And we have evolved over the last 10 years with the types of PPE and tasks and situations that we're putting our team members in. And so that was really the basis for why we made these changes and why we felt like it was important to include all of these new categories and, and types of apparel. Yeah. And if you haven't seen the webinar, I would definitely suggest checking it out. We're given a brief overview of what PB70 is, but Sharon and Jill did a great job going into a lot of detail, showing pictures, showing those critical zones on the gowns. I know one thing we kind of mentioned during that webinar that I think is important to mention here is, you know, if you're in a single room sterile processing with one sink, do you really need a protective back? You really shouldn't have that splashing going on the backside. But if you're in a large SPD where you've got sinks and people are working back to back and people at each sink, maybe you do need protective back because there will be a lot more splashing, people turning around. So I do think that's going to be huge for the risk assessments. And then the labeling, that's going to be massive for surveys and everything. I can't tell you the number of times I've had a survey. Uh, how do you know this gown's not expired? How do you know what the expiration date is? Having it on the gown and then having the level of the gown, whether it's open back, knowing what you're putting on. I think you phrased it perfectly. It's going to be really huge. So we don't have time to to go too much deeper into PB70. But Sharon, do you have any final thoughts uh, for everybody on the document or takeaways from it? I would definitely go to the Amy website and um, you can do a search for the PB70 document that just got advertised yesterday and to purchase that copy. I would definitely, I'm just, I'm just excited about the document as a whole, especially the decontam um, for our SPD folks. All right. And Jill, same question. Um, yeah, we, we've done so much work on this for many years and and I think you'll see that reflected in the document. Um, it does seem overwhelming at first as you start to look at it, but I think that you'll find that it's a great guidance document and it, it's especially great if, if you're looking to make changes in the place that you work, or like you said, if you're an area that you have an open back gown, but you really feel like that's not appropriate, this is the the document. It's a standard. It, so it's it's something that you can turn to to say, the, these are the guidelines that we need to follow to make sure that we're safe. And so this can really be of help when you have it and you use it as a tool to make sure that everyone is is wearing the appropriate things. So I, I hope that everyone finds it very helpful and, and a great um, update with all of these changes that we've made. Thank you both for being here. Uh, great job on the webinar. Great job here today on the podcast. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Shout out to my co-host, Kevin Anderson, who couldn't be here today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we miss you, Kevin, and we'll see you on the next one. And uh, we'll see everybody else on the next podcast. Bye, everybody. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.